Okay, so uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, uh, apologies for the, the late start. We had some uh, technical difficulties just at the very worst moment when we were just about to start. Uh, but in any case, uh, a warm welcome, a warm virtual welcome to the Habibi Center and to today's uh, Talking ASEAN webinar. My name is Ibrahim and I'll be moderating today's uh, Talking ASEAN webinar on post-COVID ASEAN shifting political security paradigms, uh, question mark. Uh, so today's a, a special event for a number of reasons, uh, not least because uh, today is part of our, the Habibi Center's uh, 21st anniversary. So we had a, a webinar earlier today and, and today we're, we're having the, the second of, of the day's uh, event. So uh, thank you so much for all of you who, who are joining us and uh, participating in our celebration. So um, but by way of, of, of context, we, we know um, that the political or security issues or threats that when we normally discuss in, in the region or in ASEAN used to focus more on uh, terrorism or military issues or defense. <clears throat> uh, but what we've seen with, with the uh, pandemic is, is a clear indication or, or demonstration of how more non-traditional threats and non-traditional issues are just as important for uh, ASEAN to, to address. So we have uh, three very distinguished uh, speakers to, who are joining us today. And with them, we will be able to, to help uh, analyze how the concept of security uh, has changed during this pandemic, to explore how the COVID-19 has affected the political and security discourse across the globe, especially for ASEAN and the major powers, and to discuss how should ASEAN respond to such shifts in paradigms and what kind of cooperation uh, mechanisms will be built by ASEAN countries in the post-COVID-19 world. So um, we have, as I mentioned, three very distinguished speakers. We have uh, Aristio Rizka Darmawan, uh, we have Pa uh, Shofwan Albana Khoiruzad, and we have Bu Mira Parmasasari. So thank you, uh, the three of you, for, for joining us uh, today. So uh, without taking up too much time, um, I'd like to maybe invite our first speaker to, to give his uh, presentation. And before uh, I give him the floor, I'll just read out quickly his uh, bio. But Aristia is a research, uh, Aristio is a researcher and lecturer in international law at the Center for Sustainable Ocean Policy at the Faculty of Law, uh, University of Indonesia. His research focuses on the law of the sea and maritime security in Southeast Asia. Uh, he holds a master's degree in international law from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. And um, he is a extensive writer in, in Jakarta Post, the interpreter and East Asia Forum uh, amongst others. So, uh, Patricio, I'd like to invite you to give the first uh, presentation. So, uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Habibi Center for, and Mas Ibrahim also for the very kind invitations to join this very uh, important and timely discussions on the uh, implication of COVID-19 to security and will there be a shifting political security paradigms in the uh, uh, regions. So what I'm trying to do uh, in the next 50 to 20 minutes is I, I want to briefly uh, discuss uh, about the security challenge that is uh, 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 happened uh, post or uh, during uh, and post uh, the COVID-19 in, in more uh, broad and general terms. And then at last, I, I will discuss uh, just, just maybe a little bit about will there be a, a, politi uh, a huge or a dramatic uh, political uh, security uh, paradigms in the regions. So, uh, and I apologize, I, I'm, well, I'm not using slides, so, uh, so you will, will be seeing my, my face for the next like 50 minutes. Uh, uh, so uh, next month, December 2020, is remarked exactly uh, a year after the first case of COVID-19's outbreak was detected in Wuhan, China, the virus has spread to nearly all countries on Earth, uh, including the regions uh, such as Vietnam. Uh, uh, such as Vietnam, uh, such despite the uh, success stories of, of combating the pandemic in regions such as Vietnam, uh, most of Asian states are still struggling to contain the outbreak with more than three. 200,000 cases across the regions. The pandemic uh, has hit some ASEAN's economy particularly hard. As an example, in the second quarter, uh, uh, Indonesia GDP contracted from 5.32%, uh, deeper plunge than expected. Where, uh, on the other hand, also the Philippine economy also shrank uh, by 16.5% uh, in the first half of the 2020. 
Therefore, we, we have to admit that uh, the impact of the COVID-19 crisis has been multidimensional with the questions raised about the immediate and longer term uh, uh, effects in security, trade, and also geopolitics in the regions. Uh, the absence of the, any global rebose, uh, response has been striking uh, despite the widespread pleas from the international organizations for international cooperations and a connected multilateral approach in addressing this global uh, public health crisis. While the whole world for, has not materialized, the major power, the United States and China, have been uh, offering a pandemic assistance to consolidate a bolster their influence key in the regions. Uh, so this Asia regions uh, of significant strategic uh, for both uh, has been a focal point. During the pandemic, uh, Beijing and Washington have increased the significant humanitarian aid for some countries in the regions, posing a dilemma for those nations, how to accept the assistance and yet maintain the ASEAN traditional neutrality encapsulate in the concepts of region centrality in the Indo-Pacific. Among ASEAN leaders, the pandemic has added a mounting pressure they had already uh, been feeling in recent years, particularly uh, the rivalry between the United States and China has heated up. The two powers have been uh, pursuing their respective strategies to strengthen relationships in the regions. China with uh, its Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, and also the United States with a free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. The revival of the quadrilateral security dialogue known as Quad was also an emerging uh, issues in the regions. Uh, the emergence of the COVID-19 has lent a uh, new urgency for the contest. For instance, in China is including ASEAN in its two billion uh, US dollars COVID uh, international aid program. Beijing also has donated a personal protect, uh, protective equipment and other medical supplies to ASEAN countries and to organizations uh, such as the ASEAN Secretariat in Jakarta for the, for the distributions. Uh, and also, uh, as we might already uh, recall, uh, in March, China dispatched uh, testing kits, surgical masks, and other items to the Philippines and Indonesia, while it also sent a team of medical uh, experts to Cambodia. We can also see that the ASEAN and Chinese foreign ministers meeting in Vientiane issued a statement of COVID-19 pledging to strengthen cooperations, information exchange, and mutual assistance. A further statement in May called the joint efforts to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on the regional and global trade and investment, restored confidence in economy and trade, and also pursue opportunities to achieve sustainable long-term growth of international trade and investment. On the other hand, the United States also made its own diplomatic moves in the regions. In May, uh, the United States Department released a statement on the Indo-Pacific cooperations on COVID-19 that underscores the importance of cooperations and information sharing with, with partners in the regions. The United States also contributed a significant humanitarian aid to the ASEAN uh, member states. Uh, by early May, for example, Washington had released 57.5 million US dollars to help Southeast Asian countries to, to fight the virus and the pandemics with uh, around 7.3 US dollars millions uh, allocated to Indonesia alone. The US aid programs include support for the cases for detections and also contract uh, tracing. The outreach that the US and China uh, have each undertaken to help several ASEAN members through the pandemic has been taking place against the backdrop of the deteriorating of Sino-American relations. The two sides had already been engaged in a trade war covering around 360 billion of Chinese goods and more than 110 billion of American products in January this year. Even as the coronavirus was beginning its global spread, Beijing and Washington hashed out the phase one of trade deals. And then my second uh, 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 security threat is also uh, might in the context of, of more on the uh, security challenge in, uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, even though it's uh, regarded as a, a, a still a traditional challenge, I think it's, it's also uh, been a, a highlight during the pandemic. Uh, we, we have seen the hidden tensions between US and China over the South China Sea have put stress on ASEAN neutral stance. In the recent months during the pandemic, China has increased its presence in the disputed area, possibly motivated by an assessment that the US defense posture in the regions had been weakened by the coronavirus. The Chinese Coast Guard has clashed with the vessels for, uh, both from Vietnam and Malaysia. And therefore, the US has alleged China is using the pandemic when most of the climate states are preoccupied with the dealing with the crisis to take forward strategic ambitions. Since the pandemic started, most of ASEAN countries have had to divert funds to the coronavirus response effort. Indonesia, for example, uh, have announced that uh, it's reallocated nearly around 588 million 
from its defense budget for in order to uh, secure the COVID-19 assistance. Uh, Thailand uh, 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 also reduced its defense spending by around like 555 million US dollars, allocating money for public health. Other ASEAN countries is also facing the uh, pretty much same conditions in limiting their capacity to maintain regular military patrol and law enforcement. China moves in the South China Sea have promoted the US to step up its presence in the area. After Malaysia issued a strong criticism of China Nine Dash Line claim, the US Secretary Mike Pompeo recently called the Indonesia and Singapore foreign ministers to reiterate the American support for Southeast Asian states upholding their sovereign, sovereign rights and interests under international law, underscoring the Washington's oppositions to Beijing efforts to use coercion to put the US views as unlawful maritime claims. Uh, in the case of Indonesia, which has clashed with China over areas in the, Nat in the Natuna Island and Singapore reaffirmed the neutrality in the dispute. Indonesian's foreign minister Retno Marsudi said that the pandemic was Indonesia's priority and thanking the US for its assistance with ventilators and the promise of vaccine. Uh, as we might aware that on July 13, Pompeo uh, art articulate much sharper US positions, denouncing that the Beijing claims in the South China Sea completely unlawful Scorsing China its campaign of bullying to control its offshore uh, resources. He gave full support uh, to the Permanent Court of Arbitration's ruling in support of the Philippines case that the Chinese claims was went illegal under international law of the sea. Uh, Pompeo's full throated support in 2016's arbitra arbitral judgment against China highlighted how the Philippines has become the prime example of ASEAN's country torn apart in the midst of the US-China competitions. The growing intensity of the rivalry has made neutrality a thicker and more difficult positions for ASEAN to maintain. The diverse uh, to the maintain uh, Apex Americana status quo contends with the obvious fact of China rise in economic power, source of trade and investment, and with the pandemic urgently needed a humanitarian assistance. Even the President Duterte from Philippines has repeatedly praised China's leader Xi Jinping for, the, for providing medical and other COVID-19 assistance to the Philippines. Manila has been assessing the South China Sea claim from, from by the Chinese move most recently to declare a section of territory claimed by the Philippines to be part of the China southernmost province of Hainan. Du uh, President Duterte in a recent month has blown a cold and hold uh, a war with China behavior in the South China Sea, sometimes appearing conciliatory, sometimes openly casuistic. With the US, with the US, the president has been a similarly ambivalent facilitating between terminating and then reserving the withdrawal from the visiting force agreement with Washington that allows US military deployment in the Philippines. Therefore, uh, it has become more relevant uh, on the questions that can ASEAN neutrality withstand the push and pull of the major powers quarrels. For some also the Cold War has regularly begun China uh, presence in the region is likely to grow and the US is expected to expand its engagement as the way to challenge Beijing influence in the regions. ASEAN member states uh, may struggle to maintain its middle ground, its centrality in the regions, or at least in the appearance of uh, impartiality in the US-China clash. The wooling will be instanced uh, in the wake that Pompeo's thoughts on the South China Sea uh, converted the ASEAN officials to express concerns about the increasing risk of a conflict in the disputed area. In meeting in Hanoi, uh, uh, Hainan on August 20, the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi and the Indonesian's counterpart, Marsudi, agreed that the ASEAN and China should work on conclude the COC in the South China Sea as soon as possible. Vietnam, the current ASEAN chair, had been expected to push for an agreement on the COC as soon as next year, but the pandemic has hindered the progress. The task of the moving negotiations will be uh, now fall to Brunei as the next year chairs. While the new elected uh, United States President Joe Biden might have their own foreign policy, the US-China uh, uh, competitions and rivalry are likely to remain engaged in the tug of war in the regions. Some countries may openly lean on way one another, as Cambodia, for instance, has recently uh, developed a dependency relationship with China, but the ASEAN centrality still should be a priority in the regions. But if the US-China rivalry intensifies into a bitter Cold War enmity, ASEAN countries might well uh, make a difficult strategic choice. And, and the third, uh, some sort of like traditional uh, security issues is the potential uh, uh, increasing number of piracy in the regions. 
Indonesia and Southeast Asia have long been regarded as one of the most dangerous zones of piracy, with more than 60% of all maritime piracy incidents between 1993 to 2015 occurred in Southeast Asia, with more than 20% of those incidents taking place in the Indonesian's water alone. An economic downtown caused uh, by the pandemic will not only impact the budget of militaries and maritime law enforcement agencies that combat piracy, but may actually trigger an increase in piracy incident. For instance, as Robert McCabe observed in 1993, there were only 10 incidents of piracy in Indonesia's water, while in 1999, just two years after the Asian financial crisis in 1997, uh, the number of incidents had increased to 115, more than tenfold uh, in less than 10 years. Uh, what a quite uh, significant number indeed. Uh, another statistic uh, form, the RECAP, the Regional Cooperation's Agreement on Combating Piracy and Armed Robbery shows that in 2010, just two years after the 2008 financial crisis, piracy incident had increased 25%. This increase likely uh, stemmed from a combination of strengthened economic motives to combat piracy and reduce law enforcement capacity uh, at sea due to the budget cut. Uh, maritime cooperation initiatives uh, such as the joint piracy patrols will also be affected by those cuts. As Indonesia makes a necessary budget adjustment in the light of economic impacts of COVID-19, it should be careful to consider that the effect of those reallocations, as well as the challenge most likely to materialize in the current environment. In the realm of security, Indonesia should pay a special attention to threats that stand in the excreted both during and post uh, pandemic outbreak. Maritime security threat uh, from the increasing assertive China as well as the piracy problem that likely to grow in the aftermath of the pandemic. Uh, I would suggest that budget cuts to Indonesia maritime capabilities will need to be carefully administered. If Indonesia can decide which capa capabilities to prioritize, it can mitigate the toll that these cuts will uh, take on the security both its own water and in the region at large. So uh, I think uh, taking the considerations that the, the traditional security or, or threat in the regions uh, during and post pandemic is still will be increasing. So I think uh, the realm or the discourse of security uh, during and post the pandemic, uh, it's still very much uh, difficult. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, there will be a lot of uh, other uh, elements, security elements that increase after the pandemic, for instance, like human security, health crisis issues, and those kind of things. But I think uh, also uh, the traditional securities that rising up after the pandemic, it's also will be still in the major discourse. So, so I think uh, uh, states or ASEAN uh, uh, after the, the post COVID-19 uh, security challenges, it's much more uh, uh, difficult uh, in a sense that there will be a lot of uh, security uh, issues. Uh, so, so, that, so I don't think that ASEAN have the privilege or luxuries uh, to, to choose on with which security issues, either traditional or non-traditional security uh, to be focused on. So I think with the uh, more complex uh, uh, security challenge situations, I think ASEAN uh, cooperations uh, uh, should be more uh, enhanced in, in, in many form. So I think uh, I'll, I'm gonna stop there and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to the discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Aristio. Uh, for the very, um, very uh, in-depth uh, presentation. So next we move on to Bart Shofwan, who is a lecturer at the International Relations Department and also the Executive Secretary at the ASEAN Study Center uh, at the University of Indonesia. He holds a Doctor of Philosophy from the Graduate School of International Relations from Ritsumaikan University in Kyoto, uh, as well as a Master of Arts uh, from the same uh, institution and a bachelor's degree in social sciences from the University of Indonesia. So, uh, Bash, uh, Shafwan, the, the floor is yours. Uh, Shafwan, I think your mic yes. is muted. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Ibrahim, and thank you very much for the Habibi Center uh, for allowing me to participate in this uh, uh, very important uh, event. And I would like to also congratulate uh, Habibi Center for the uh, anniversary uh, uh, and looking forward for uh, uh, more uh, collaboration and uh, contribution to uh, the Indonesian uh, public. And uh, my task today here is to uh, 
give my uh, view on uh, how the discourse of security uh, will be evolving uh, during and after the uh, pandemic. So here, uh, I would like to uh, add uh, the already very comprehensive presentation uh, by Pa uh, Aristio before, uh, which uh, in the end still say that uh, probably uh, the traditional uh, notion of security will uh, remain. Uh, I will, uh, 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 to some extent, uh, agree with that uh, argument, but uh, by adding uh, several uh, other uh, things. So uh, what to expect? Uh, if we look uh, at the number of uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, cases and deaths in ASEAN. We can say that uh, ASEAN is uh, also not spared from this tsunami, which affect the lives, not only uh, people at individual levels, but also uh, to the national and even uh, in uh, the international uh, levels. Uh, not only the direct public health uh, impact is tremendous, we also witness that uh, it has um, uh, secondary uh, impacts uh, in the economy. People are already talking about how uh, we are uh, likely to enter another Great uh, Depression. And if we talk about Great Depression, uh, we uh, could not uh, uh, move our thoughts from uh, our historical experience with Great Depression, which is coming together with uh, a major uh, a great and hegemonic wars, which uh, create disruption in the international order. So what to expect? How uh, the arrival of this pandemic and uh, the inability of us uh, to escape uh, the pandemic effectively. So talking about post-COVID is a little bit optimistic now, uh, especially in Indonesia where uh, our numbers are still rising and uh, we don't see any second wave because we are still in the first wave. Anyway, uh, uh, so let's assume that there will be some post-pandemic world, hopefully. Uh, uh, but uh, what is going to uh, happen? Uh, so the question asked to me is how COVID-19 will change the conceptualization of security in ASEAN and beyond? Uh, I think this, this question is interesting because uh, this uh, treats the concept of security not as something uh, that is given, it, it, it acknowledged that the conceptualization of security is contested. And I think this is the uh, correct way to understand uh, security. Uh, security is a contested concept. If we look at history, uh, for example, the, the introduction of the concept of collective security uh, is connected to the establishment of the League of Nations and it's very much connected to the disruption of the uh, long peace order, uh, which is supported by the balance of power in Europe. And people are looking uh, for a new way to uh, prevent uh, uh, wars to occur again. Uh, and uh, people are uh, uh, then uh, introducing this concept of collective security, which is uh, if uh, a threat and aggression uh, uh, from one country against an another country is a threat for uh, all countries. Uh, we also see how uh, changes in uh, international uh, politics at the end of uh, the Cold War uh, creates the uh, rise of the concept of human security uh, in which we uh, see how uh, the referent object of security is shifted uh, or at least expanded from the state to, uh, to the individual. And this could not be 
uh, seen only as a natural evolution of the concept, but also something uh, that occurs because of the changing uh, uh, context. So uh, to answer this question, we should uh, understand, we should uh, in the position that uh, conceptualization of security is always contextual. It is political and historical. If we uh, look from this perspective, how states or at least the dominant uh, configuration of power, which in a historical, uh, 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 in, in a, a specific historical uh, phase is the state and specific state at that, the great powers, uh, uh, the conceptualization of security uh, facilitates this dominant configuration or uh, in a more uh, conceptual uh, manner, we often uh, term this, uh, we often call this uh, in a term uh, uh, of international order. So uh, with that uh, assumption in place, uh, then uh, I will try to answer uh, how uh, the uh, pandemic will affect our understanding or our uh, conceptualization of uh, security. Uh, at least there are two ideal scenarios. The first scenario is where because of the pandemic, then state realize uh, that uh, non-traditional security threats such as health as manifested in the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is also important. So. Uh, the, then uh, we will witness uh, more acceptance toward more inclusive concept of security, which includes uh, the uh, prioritization of non-traditional uh, security uh, threats, uh, such as uh, health, etc. And because of the nature of this non-traditional security is centered at individuals and they this threat uh, do not manage and arranged in uh, following uh, uh, borders, then uh, we can expect that if more inclusive concept of security is uh, to be uh, widely, uh, more widely accepted, we will witness that international or even transnational cooperation will be more uh, uh, and more uh, uh, expanding. However, uh, we also have the scenario two in which rather than opening the door for more inclusive concept of security, the uh, pandemic uh, uh, created uh, hate and insecurity uh, among, among states. Uh, and this hate and insecurity among states creates uh, uh, rather than uh, the uh, creation of more inclusive, the acceptance of more inclusive concept of security, then uh, uh, create uh, uh, and harden the traditional notion of state-centric uh, 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 security concepts uh, in which uh, will uh, increase uh, tensions. So the rather than opening the door for more inclusive uh, understanding of security and providing uh, incentives for international or even transnational cooperation. Uh, in scenario two, we will witness increasing uh, tensions accelerated by uh, this uh, uh, pandemic. Of course, these two scenarios are uh, ideal uh, models uh, in which the reality might not only uh, mirroring this uh, uh, either or uh, scenario. Uh, it might be the combination of uh, both scenarios. Uh, but how, how do we know this? Uh, if we which scenario will, will, will uh, be realized and particularly in the context of ASEAN. I think it's important to, again, uh, since the conceptualization of security is uh, historical, is contextual, it's historical and political, maybe 
it is good to look at uh, history yes and history is a laboratory in which our generalizations about international politics uh, can be tested this is the picture of uh, the plague of athens and students of international relations is of course familiar with a uh, uh, story of plague of athens because uh, uh, students of IR are, are familiar with the uh, uh, Thucydides' work on the Peloponnesian War. So this uh, was told in uh, this uh, uh, epic story of the Peloponnesian War. And uh, from uh, that uh, story, we can uh, infer several uh, lessons. And the first is that um, the uh, the pandemic uh, uh, accelerates uh, shifts in the balance of power uh, quickly. And we we show how uh, the 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 notes by Thucydides shows that. Uh, uh, the impact of the pandemic had cost Athens uh, its uh, superiority over uh, the seas because uh, Athens was strong on the Aegean seas while uh, Spartans uh, were strong uh, on, on land and this disease spread from uh, the sea uh, so then uh, Athens was affected worse than uh, Sparta, and this create uh, a situation in which uh, Athens' uh, downfall was accelerated. Uh, the uh, second, uh, we don't know uh, uh, how uh, a pandemic can be uh, effectively uh, contained. Powers uh, often uh, calculated uh, through numbers of armies, the numbers of uh, weapons, number of uh, uh, capital that you have often uh, uh, does not uh, matter much in, in this context. And even uh, the large uh, wealth of Athens uh, actually created uh, this problem because this wealth was generated through uh, uh, very uh, international trade, and it is because of this international trade, Athens were most, more sus, uh, susceptible to uh, this uh, plague. Uh, so, uh, 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 from this, I think uh, we can uh, go and try to reflect um, uh, this in our current uh, international order. So, I will go. Uh, by uh, trying to uh, uh, provide uh, an understanding on international order. And one of the uh, uh, definitions that I really like is by Andrew Phillips uh, in defining international order and the systemat systemic structures that cohere within culturally and histori historically specific social imaginaries. It is uh, 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 it is composed of two uh, components, the order producing normative complex and, fundament, and, and, and the fundamental institutions in which uh, that normative uh, complex was uh, manifested uh, in, uh, in an institutionalized manner. And these two institutions, in, in these two fundamental uh, uh, elements of this international order uh, uh, were embedded within the uh, order enabling uh, material uh, foundation or context. Um, so then uh, let us uh, look at uh, uh, our uh, post-World War international order. Uh, it uh, evolved uh, after the World War II and continue to be uh, evolving. But in general, there are several uh, features that continuously uh, be in this particular uh, international order. First, if we look at the order enabling material foundation, we see the basis is the double monopoly. The first monopoly is the 
monopoly of authorities by state, the uh, totalitarian, totalitarian capability of the state to monopoly uh, authorities, uh, to monopoly finance, to uh, monopoly uh, control over uh, taxation, uh, over uh, data, etc. And uh, second is the among these states, uh, uh, there is also a monopoly. So there are, there is a monopoly of capability uh, among uh, these states. Uh, uh, based on this order enabling material foundation, uh, then we uh, see that uh, there is a normative complex which animate the uh, interaction between. Uh, units in the international system at this particular time, which is the idea of free trade and the idea of uh, uh, democracy. Um, recent uh, trade war uh, stagnation in uh, uh, multilateral organization, etc., are uh, symptoms uh, that this order producing normative complex uh, is uh, no longer. Uh, uh, effectively holding uh, the uh, behavior of uh, its members. And the third is the fundamental institutions, uh, which is marked by multilateralism, alliance, uh, the uh, Bretton Woods institutions, which uh, evolve uh, contextually. Uh, what is interesting is that these fundamental institutions manifested differently in different regions. Uh, in which then create different regional uh, uh, architectures in Europe and uh, in East Asia. Uh, so this is uh, uh, to understand the uh, possibility of a concept a shift in the conceptualization of uh, uh, security. We need to understand the uh, regional uh, order, uh, the regional international order uh, in which uh, ASEAN uh, is uh, uh, is living. So, uh, if we look uh, at the regional order in East Asia, what we see now uh, is an interesting uh, phenomenon, which is quite different from Europe, because uh, uh, the different strategic choices by the United States, uh, the hegemon in the post-war war situation, uh, uh, give a different uh, shape of uh, the region. Of course, that doesn't mean that uh, other actors are just responding. However, uh, the uh, choice of the US provide uh, uh, a context in which these actors uh, will uh, uh, be able to offer uh, their own uh, alternatives. In, in this case, ASEAN uh, came from uh, this development. Unlike EU, which is uh, created as an attempt to go beyond nation state, ASEAN was actually uh, established to uh, maintain and to uh, secure the nation state. Uh, so in the post-World uh, War, uh, uh, era, the regional security system in East Asia, which was uh, developed by the US, is uh, called the hub and spoke system, uh, in which uh, US uh, led the uh, mechanism not through a formal alliance like in EU, uh, in uh, NATO. There are efforts to develop like CATO, but it was uh, failed. And uh, and, and in the economic uh, uh, dimension, we witness the development of the triangular uh, trade system, which uh, in which uh, U.S. attempts to contain both the communism, China and U Soviet, and at the same time containing Japan. That's why uh, U.S. Uh, 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 support uh, Japan economically, but also uh, somehow direct. Uh, its economic expansion, not to China, but to Southeast Asia, which then uh, creates the uh, trigger, uh, create the direction for regional integration in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, China entered this uh, arrangement in late 1980s. So now what we are witnessing is that 
China uh, as a rising power has become deeply integrated into the economic architecture and benefiting from it, but excluded from the heaven uh, spokes uh, system. So we see that there are separation of uh, spheres here in, in East Asia. The security and economic realms are uh, separated as two uh, different realms. And the existence of these two different realms was also accommodated if we look at the uh, concept of ASEAN itself. That's why uh, I, I uh, propose to call ASEAN as compartmentalized regionalism. So it is uh, a regionalism in which actually different uh, pro regional projects are uh, commencing. So there are uh, there is a regional project which is uh, responding to and uh, adapting to the hub and spoke system of the US, which is at the security uh, compartment, uh, but also uh, the regional integration project, which is based on the uh, market uh, uh, imperative of uh, the uh, development of the uh, 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 multinational companies from Japan and from uh, China. So this is actually two different processes in which uh, uh, through uh, smart and uh, particular historical uh, event then uh, put together into ASEAN. So uh, ASEAN is uh, a political uh, project which is uh, actually consists of multiple and separated or compartmentalized patterns of arrangement of the regional spaces but combined and identified a single project. Uh, so there is a, nine, a 1967 ASEAN uh, which focuses on uh, political security and responding to the idea of US hub and spokes and, and, and was established to contain communism and the 1990s ASEAN, which is the, the uh, ASEAN of economic integration, the ASEAN integration, which is driven by uh, market forces. Um, and it is interesting uh, to note that two different arrangements. One is inclusive uh, uh, of uh, China and one is uh, uh, exclusive of it uh, uh, was uh, can, can go uh, together and it is able to be held together because of ASEAN centrality. ASEAN centrality uh, uh, provides the ability to, to connect these two different realms but at the same time uh, keeping uh, the uh, compartmentalization uh, independent of each other. Uh, so I would like to argue that uh, central ASEAN centrality rests in this uh, compartmentalization, and this compartmentalization, on, uh, uh, at the same time, is kept by uh, this uh, ASEAN centrality. So, uh, if we look at ASEAN centrality, a lot of uh, discussion and debates among observers. Uh, many argue that. Uh, it is uh, temporary, it is a minimalist per gain among great powers in post-Cold War situation uh, in which make ASEAN is accepted by the great powers. But some others focus on the normative accept, uh, aspect which uh, see the acceptance of ASEAN way as the norm to follow in, in regional interstate relations. Another see uh, uh, the centrality of ASEAN as uh, uh, ASEAN's position in the node of cluster of networks, uh, which places it as the central hub in the regional architecture. Um, and there are also uh, understanding that great powers are accepting ASEAN because uh, ASEAN is not uh, threatening, it's less threatening than its uh, rival uh, counterpart and thus making ASEAN acceptable to be the central actor uh, in the region. However, uh, this uh, centrality of ASEAN in the uh, regional order, which hold together the contradiction uh, between the uh, economic and the political uh, spheres, uh, political architecture in the region, 
uh, uh, may uh, uh, change, the future is less certain because we see there are changes in the order enabling material foundation. Uh, first, in the first monopoly in the state system, we witness that there are changes. We see that non-state actors uh, are becoming uh, more influential, especially amidst these pandemics, because non-state actors control vaccines. Of course, industrial policy matter, uh, investment of the state is crucial uh, to, uh, to uh, provide support for the industry. But uh, we also uh, see that the private initiative is also uh, uh, strong in this. Uh, another uh, aspect which is also becoming very prominent during pandemic is the big data. Uh, people are going online, everything is going online and there's uh, uh, many parts of our life uh, uh, contained, contained in the cyberspace and uh, those uh, uh, um, who control the monopoly over this cyberspace will uh, of course, be influential actor. And in this sense, many states are unable to keep their uh, monopoly because companies such as Facebook, Twitter, uh, and other uh, big companies are uh, having their uh, hands on this uh, 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 big data. So there is a, indeed a, a shift in, in the monopoly of authority by the state because it is uh, uh, gradually uh, diminishing. The monopoly uh, among the states is also uh, increase, uh, decreasing because of the uh, rise of China and the rest and the relative decline of the United States. Um, on the aspect of fundamental institutions, uh, uh, we see that consensus of ASEAN centrality is not fixed. Uh, we see in Cambodia uh, 2012, we, uh, the we uh, ASEAN are unable to uh, uh, publish a joint communique uh, and, and many uh, other uh, symptoms are there. Uh, in the norm order producing normative complex, we also witness that there are alternative uh, models uh, which also uh, emerge. Of course, this symptom uh, of international disorder is already uh, uh, can be seen as in the uh, WHO SEGA uh, and also in the uh, trade war and uh, many uh, tensions between the US and China, which is already emerged even before the pandemic. So where are we heading? It seems that uh, uh, I would like to echo uh, what Pa Aristio has mentioned. Uh, the uh, pandemic accelerates the uh, breakdown of international and regional order. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, this is uh, not happening in, in such a rapid uh, manner, uh, but uh, we uh, witness the strengthening of the state-centrist concept of security. Rather than realizing that uh, we cannot survive on uh, weapons and on state alone, uh, 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 states uh, start to uh, uh, securitizing health you know, rather than uh, op opening the door for inclusive conceptualization of security, which allows for more cooperation. Uh, somehow we witness the expansion of the traditional security logic in non-traditional security issue. So the, the, the logic is state-centric, but the field is becoming uh, 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 more uh, broad and more expanding. Uh, and it is connected to the shift in uh, the monopoly of authority and uh, capacity. Of course, states cannot neglect uh, non-state entities. And we see how this race on vaccine uh, shows us uh, uh, exactly this. We see uh, how uh, states are racing to cooperate with companies. Recently, Pa Luhut went to the US to, to make a deal with uh, Pfizer, uh, which is uh, a bit uh, controversial because Indonesia uh, actually has uh, already has deals with uh, previously with other uh, uh, vaccine uh, uh, producers with Indonesia uh, is uh, uh, already 
uh, how to say, uh, have a, a cooperation and already uh, have uh, uh, a deal with uh, Sinovac and Novavax. Mm. So uh, it, it creates a lot of, uh, how to say, confusion. Uh, but of course, this confusion can be understood in, in, in the terms of, uh, how to say, the securitization of uh, this non-traditional uh, security, the expansion of the state-centric logic on the non-traditional uh, security uh, fields. So rather than creating a more uh, inclusive understanding of security, we witness an exclusive and more state-centric understanding of uh, security, but with a more expansive uh, uh, sector. So, uh, uh, of course, this combination is going to be uh, continuously negotiated. And I think uh, how this will play out will be strongly tied on the commitment and consensus to ASEAN centrality. And with that, uh, I uh, end my presentation and looking forward for discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, returning it to you, Mr. Ibrahim. Thank you very much, Shafwan. Uh, um, so before I turn to our last speaker, I just want to remind uh, our audience who are following on YouTube, if you have any questions for our three speakers, please feel free to use the uh, chat function to, to uh, type your question and I'll read it out to our three speakers uh, during the Q&A session. So last but not least, I'd like to turn to uh, Ms. Mira. She is the director of the UD Yonu Institute. She was previously a foreign associate for CAS India. Uh, a lecturer at uh, Parayangan Catholic University and a visiting research fellow for TU Dortmund. She holds a bachelor's degree in international relations from uh, Parayangan Catholic University and also a postgraduate degree in defense management from the Indonesian Defense University. So, Ms. Mira, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, moderator, Mr. Ibrahim. Now I would like to uh, share my presentation. Um, but before, can you hear me clearly? Uh, yes, we can. Hello? Okay, okay. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, uh, Ibrahim, for your warm introduction. Before I start, on behalf of the TYI, the Udono Institute, I would like to extend sincere gratitude to the Habibi Center for inviting us to join this prestigious event. And I would like to congratulate the Habibi Center for your 21st anniversary. Congratulations. Uh, wishing all fellows of the Habibi Center a great success in many more years ahead, and we can collaborate more in the future. I would also like to extend warmest regards from our chairman um, and founder, PSB and Mas Agus, uh, to the Habibi Center. Please uh, extend our regards to Pa Ilham, uh, Mas Ibrahim. Thank okay, distinguished speakers, distinguished speakers, audience, ladies and gentlemen, um, following to the previous speakers, I would like to present my presentation today about talking ASEAN, post-COVID political security possible scenarios. Um, in this presentation, I would like to uh, propose three possible scenarios that shape the world's, uh, particularly the Southeast Asian region's political security. Uh, well, I'm not trying to be a futurologist here. This is not a crystal ball reading uh, kind of thing, but by seeing the trends, we could imagine what the region will look like on post-COVID. Um, at the end of my presentation, I will try to suggest uh, ways forward for our region in coping with uh, post-COVID trends. Um, I will highlight recent updates on global and regional situation, but uh, the, pre the two previous speakers, they have mentioned uh, about today's update. So thank you. So I, um, my job is, is uh, my burden is lesser now. Uh, th the numbers right now are not really relieving. I mean, uh, it's, it's not a good news still. So uh, as you can see here in a global situation today, I just captured from the WHO uh, report that 
um, we've seen that we're still in a big problem, right? Today we have in total more than 58 to 59 millions of people with COVID and more than 1.3 million people dead for COVID. So I read, I read a news today. Uh, I, I read that uh, in Shanghai, they, they have to shut down the airport again because of the um, another confirmed cases in the airport and they want to prevent more spread. And yesterday I read another news in Japan that they reported for a hit new record by having more than 2000 new confirmed cases of COVID. And a couple days ago in Mexico for the last, um, for the last couple of days, they reported for hundreds of thousands of deaths by COVID. Um, it, uh, uh, Mexico in the fourth with the highest rate of mortality by COVID in this world after the US, Brazil, and India. So actually, pandemic, this pandemic produces more complexities, not only to the health sector, but also to other sectors, uh, to the decrease of world's economic growth, the increase of poverty, widened in inequality, and many others. And before the pandemic happened, um, many countries in this world have struggled to reduce inequality. I, uh, as you can see here in my slide that uh, the Gini ratio, the gap between the haves and the have nots, uh, even though before pandemic is wide already, but with the global pandemic uh, right now, it is expected to make inequality even worse than before. And I, uh, I, uh, I read a report uh, made by P SPR 2020 reported that COVID-19 was likely to push between 88 uh, and 115 million people into extreme poverty, those living under $2 a day around the globe in 2020. So it's, it's not a good news. Now, take, uh, now let's take a look to the Southeast Asian region updates. It's not that relieving too. And thanks to Pat Stofan, you mentioned about the Asian region. Uh, I'm not going to uh, talk much about this, but um, now we we we're not only having uh, infectious uh, disease in the region, but also we uh, because of the pandemic, it caused more than 13 million people in ASEAN to become unemployed, pushing about 18 million people into poverty, of which three million are in extreme poverty. And what worries us most is that if we fail to make uh, corrections, uh, there's going to be an increase of unemployment and poverty. Uh, for the long time, and for the first, uh, for the very first time in 20, uh, 23 years, ASEAN uh, region's economy is expected to contract, and this is not a good news at all. So, having such facts, um, we can con we can have a conclusion that this global pandemic is a strategic shock. It's uh, very rapid, very very fast, and it's shocking to the world. What I meant is. We never imagined that a global pandemic would hit us this uh, severely. You mentioned, Pasofan, about uh, the plague of Athens. Uh, we, we did battle the Spanish flu um, in the early of uh, 20 centuries, uh, 21st, 20 centuries. And then uh, uh, there was a, a, a pandemic of uh, avian flu, swine flu, and so on and so forth. But this time we beat out big time. And um, again, uh, we might say that the war against COVID is even harder than the war on terror right now. The enemy is intangible. They don't have face <laughs> and they're, they're not human at all. But it's, it's even more lethal. So I think probably uh, some of the realists will, will hate me <laughs> because I'm going to say that military weapons seems meaningless right now <laughs> because of this uh, pandemic. But that's the reality. The world now is entering uh, into a volatile and unstable new phase. And this, this is what I call the unknown unknown. And it shows how the concept of security has changed tremendously from traditional to non-traditional. No matter how big and how rich our country is, uh, the healthiness of our citizens remains uh, pivotal. Okay, uh, because of today's discussion, I have to give uh, the so-called um, predictions. Um, I'm, I'm becoming a futurologist, but right still at the very early stages of imagining what the post-COVID world will look, will look like, uh, we, we still don't know, yeah, but let's try to see the trends, uh, what will happen. Uh, for the broader concept of security, uh, I do agree with Pass of One, so I don't have to explain more. But uh, 
I might say that uh, amidst the ongoing health crisis, this pandemic shown us that security is undeniably a far more complex notion than terrorism. As I say, nuclear threats or military built up, uh, it, it is actually uh, very much in peril and risks our nation's sense of security. Um, and the world uh, just might have become alert that its default security paradigm needs to change and focus more to human uh, security. This pandemic has forced states to fight a new kind of and this is actually a wake up call uh, for all of us uh, that human security is uh, relevant more than ever. Now I'm going to start um, uh, with the uh, three post COVID political uh, possible scenarios. The first one is uh, if the vaccine development is successful and if it's a failure. Yeah, um, it's very interesting to see uh, uh, the trends. And the second one is the post-Trump US-China relations uh, and its impacts to Southeast Asian region, uh, peace and stability. And the third one is uh, about democratic regression and the, uh, the rise of populism um, narrative. So the first scenario would be, how if the vaccine development is successful? Um, how about the supply and demand in a global scale? We know the basic economy uh, about supply and demand. We know that all countries are anxious to get the vaccine. Uh, Pak Luhut even both uh, uh, want to, to want to buy the, uh, the Pfizer, even though uh, Pak Sofan said that we've, um, we have um, MOU with Sinovac yeah, and with United, United uh, Emirates of Arab and, uh, and many others. And I heard Pak Eric Tohir went to uh, England to trying to find uh, more slots for our vaccine. So the production would be overwhelmed by billions of demands. And having the so-called vaccine uh, doesn't mean this will solve the problems easily. Even the vaccine is successful. The question will be uh, who gets first and how about the distribution and uh, how can we guarantee that it won't imperil our security and safety? This actually reminds me to the theory of uh, the prisoner's dilemma um, about the hypothesis about betraying a partner over a greater reward than cooperating with them because competition is likely to be awkward rather than cooperating. Or let's say if, if the cooperation is there on the surface, uh, but, but the underlying situation will be based on uh, vaccine nationalism. For example, the United States, they, they have Pfizer and Moderna right now, they want to produce globally or in a global scale, but they have to make sure that they, uh, uh, their stocks are sufficient enough for their people. Uh, they, they, they will uh, prioritize their own uh, security. Countries may beat against another, one another and driving up the price of vaccines. And some desperate governments may also uh, trying to jeopardize future um, future economy or security or politics for the sake of the vaccine. And the bottleneck would be when global supplies of COVID vaccines remain limited, providing them uh, to some people will necessarily delay access for others. And the truth is none of the 48 ongoing vaccines de development uh, produced by ASEAN countries. So who gets first and who can uh, guarantee that we can get all the vaccine? Now, let's see the, the other sides of the coin. What if the vaccine fails? There are still limited discussions and discourse of, of this pessimistic view of uh, vaccine development. I know that this is not the fascinating discussion, uh, um, topic to discuss, yeah? Because uh, we're trying to be up because we are so tired and exhausted of this global pandemic. But what if this vaccine fails? What will happen? Um, only time will tell us the story what will happen next but it will definitely uh, affect the global economy increasing more poverty recessions increasing tensions of politics and security and it will be um, a, a global conflict or global clash of uh, scar resources and scarcities in short it will be a, a mega uh, disruption to all mankind that's for the first scenario. This is the second scenario about the US-China rivalry. Uh, 
thanks to uh, Pak Aristio and uh, Pak Sofan once again uh, for mentioning about U.S.-China rivalry, especially for the South China Sea, so I didn't have to mention uh, uh, more details on South China Sea. But here, uh, what I want to say is um, the tension between U.S. and China, uh, US and China uh, over ASEAN uh, countries in the Southeast Asian region, well, economically speaking, both countries are suffering for um, uh, from the pandemic, and and it's not it's not easy to bounce back. And whichever country bounce back uh, stronger and faster from their own economic crisis will be in uh, a major to assert global leadership and shape the post uh, COVID um, post COVID world. So. We can see and we can say that uh, the U.S. and China, they're playing for soft power. Paris just said about uh, humanitarian assistance uh, to ASEAN countries, both China and the U.S. Um, but who gets the attention more? Will it be China, especially for Mekong reverse countries, or will it be U.S.? Well, we know that uh, under Obama's administration, uh, the U.S. Um, is very akin to pivot strategy. But it's no longer a pivot strategy right now. Um, even even though in Trump's era, or perhaps later in Biden's era, um, they agreed to not having too much domination of China in the world. But the question remains: to what extent the U.S. will presence in the in the region? And like it or not, the the pandemic gives China an opportunity to attempt to showcase its model of authoritarian state capitalism. Even though survey made by Asia Group say that a uh, lot of uh, ASEAN elites, uh, they, they perceive the rise of China as a, a, a revisionist uh, power for ASEAN countries. Um, in short, perhaps the ASEAN countries needs more uh, US in the region to balance China. And having such great legacy with pivot strategy back in 2008 and then, uh, no, sorry, 2011, 2012, um, Biden, I think, uh, in, in his administrations next January, uh, would like to have more U.S. in the region to balance China. So I read in a terms of reference about Chinese vaccine mass diplomacy, but my question would be, will it be a free lunch? Well, indeed, there is no free lunch. ASEAN should not forget what's happening in the South China Sea. We often find this issue difficult times with too little progress, even during this pandemic. Even though uh, I, I read from the statement, joint statement um, in the 37th summit of ASEAN, uh, there was a reading uh, of uh, COC, but the second reading, if I'm not mistaken, uh, of the COC, but the, it's, it's still a long way to go to, to have the so-called code of conduct in South China Sea. And we witnessed many incidents happen in the South China Sea during pandemic. Paris Dio uh, earlier said uh, about so many incidents. But so my point is dealing with the so-called major power like China, one country alone in ASEAN would not be enough. It's, it's not enough uh, only for Indonesia or Vietnam or Singapore, um, um, sorry, not Singapore, Malaysia, um, Philippines and many others. We should reunite and ASEAN should reunite. ASEAN countries, even though right now uh, it's very pessimistic to have a multilaterally, uh, multilateral uh, mechanism, but I think uh, ASEAN countries must deal with China multilaterally. It's, it's, never, uh, it's never going to be right for a bilaterally uh, mechanism because collaboration and cooperation between ASEAN member states uh, can prevent any kind of major power to dominate too much in the region. Now let's take a look to uh, the third possible scenario, uh, democratic re regression. Um, in recent years, uh, there has been a global trend toward authoritarianism stated by the Freedom House in every region of the world. Democracy is under attack by populist leaders and groups that reject pluralism. Democracy has been in regression for over a decade and many fear that COVID-19 will uh, accelerate this trend. Report made by Atlanta Council in 2020 stated that um, most, most uh, that almost every continent uh, there is a tendency that authoritarian leaders may use the virus as an opportunity to strengthen their grip on power. They try to solidify their hold on power, and this fact is not encouraging. Uh, it's a 
I must say that it's a total decline of global democracy. Um, before I continue, I must say that I'm an avid of democracy, and I know that Habibi Center is an avid of democracy as well. I, I saw the tagline is democratization must go on, right? <laughs> so learning from the hard way, our world perceives greatest challenges to democracy, and I would like to see uh, more discussions on, on, on this one. I read uh, a report from IDEA uh, made by Richard Youngs and Eileen uh, Pentelis. Uh, they say that uh, there are uh, some indicators showing that we actually in a democratic regression. Uh, the first one, some leaders, uh, some world leaders putting off elections in order to prevent their presidency or their uh, incumbency. They even use COVID as a pretext for uh, counter for uh, counter their political opposition and curtailing parliamentary oversight. And it's also a big question for media's independency and the rise of hoax, misinformation, disinformation. And then I heard that there is a new thing called uh, computational propaganda. I heard Oxford University has made a, their new study on computational propaganda, meaning that uh, it is presume that the states are uh, using big data and advanced technology massively and systemat systematically to shape public opinions. So in this case, uh, in, the, in the case of pandemic, I mean like autocratic governments can falsify their COVID-19 statistics for the sake of their own interest. And then another challenge would be the enactment of emergency powers that bypass accountability and oversight process that may uh, increase the risk of corruption and mismanagement of the uh, uh, national or local governance. And the trend will be, uh, well, we need to be prepared for another wave of populism and spread of nationalistic narratives. And it's not a pleasant thing to see uh, if we are an avid of democracy. So I also want to raise another issue about this debate. I saw uh, very interesting uh, figures uh, from The Economist. There's also a big debate during this global pandemic, which type of political system has dealt best, best with the COVID-19 health emergency? Is it a, a democratic government or the autocratic governments? Some might say that China is one example of the best practice in dealing with pandemic, but I, but I think in my um, humble opinion, it's just an oversimplification. I know in some autocratic administration, they could easily move people, um, ask them what to do, and just because they are used to it. But let's take a look to other best practices. Even better, countries like New Zealand and Australia have shown us that democracy uh, could be better in dealing with, with pandemic. And in this slide, you may see uh, the figures made by the economists stated that in the past 60 years, epidemics have been less deadly in democracies. So in this case, the type of political system per se do not necessarily determine the effectiveness of handling this pandemic. Uh, we often forget the other important factors, um, which is the effective leadership and, and, and governance uh, itself. To sum up my presentation, let's figure out the ways forwards for our world, particularly to ASEAN. Well, I know it's a bit wordy, but <laughs> the first one, the world does, it, does not organize itself. I heard it from Biden, Joseph Biden. The world does not organize itself. So the world must be socially constructed by the states. Um, COVID-19 produced major and important ramification for international um, security and democracy. We should find ways uh, to achieve the two. We, we should find ways to balance the two. Competition may occur uh, in the short term, but cooperation is mandatory for the, for the survival of the whole population uh, in the longer term. So I think to solve uh, problems in the global pandemic, global cooperation is mandatory on vaccine allocation. Um, that would be the most efficient way to solve the problem, even though we, we know that it's very hard to achieve. Yeah because of vaccine nationalism, because of a self-reliant uh, principle of each country. So for ASEAN, it's very important to build and strengthen communication, diplomacy, and multilateral partnership. We need more ASEAN in the uh, relation of the region. And ASEAN is a, a crystal clear post-COVID strategy and direction that places health and human security as one of the top agenda. 
I heard from the statement by the uh, Secretary General uh, uh, of ASEAN, uh, they launch a, a new body. Uh, it's like a, an ASEAN CDC. Hopefully they will uh, continue and then uh, it's not only a concept, but it can be realized into a reality and very effective to, to see uh, ASEAN handling with global pandemic. And uh, in this term, we also need to welcome the US um, to balance China in the region and bringing ASEAN members closer together in maintaining ASEAN centrality. Um, in regards to democracy, uh, we need to revisit the quest for a full-fledged democracy into ASEAN's discourse. Uh, I know it's a, it's a long way to go, but we agreed in ASEAN Charter that we're going there, we're gonna be there. And ASEAN should be progressing in the realm of democracy. Uh, moving forward, ASEAN states must uh, acknowledge the need for cooperative and collaborative efforts. Um, as stated by Adam Malik, um, uh, years ago, national resilience through regional resilience. I think it's uh, it's very important for ASEAN to remember the founding fathers' uh, 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 statement made by uh, Adam Malik. Uh, every every member states must contribute, and everyone must buy in. Last but not least, uh, I just want to reiterate that ASEAN problems needs ASEAN solution. This will make ASEAN be ready to face any challenges and any kind of possible scenarios that will um, occur in the political security agenda of the post-COVID era. And that brings us uh, to the end of my presentation. Yeah, thank you so much for your interest and attention. I sincerely appreciate your attention uh, this afternoon. Uh, I would like to finish with this powerful quote from Mandy Hill uh, saying that, uh, trust the weight, Embrace the uncertainty, enjoy the beauty of becoming. When nothing, in, uh, when nothing is certain, anything is possible. Thank you. Wabilahi Taufiqul Hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Mila, for the very uh, inspirational quote. And I think uh, fully in agreement that ASEAN problem needs uh, ASEAN solutions. Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we now uh, turn to our Q&A session. We have uh, a few questions already from our participants. So I'll read them out to, for our four speakers. Uh, the first is addressed specifically to uh, uh, Shafwan from the Sri Lankan Embassy in Indonesia. And he asks um, to uh, Shafwan, in your opinion, does the post COVID-19 uh, world, will, will it make Indonesia more, in the, more dependent on other countries for political security and stability? Uh, and also questions to the other, to all the speakers, uh, also from the Sri Lankan Embassy is, how will the recent signing of the RCEP between ASEAN and several other countries uh, impact the political security in the region? Uh, we have a question from uh, Masnoto to all speakers. Uh, do you think the COVID-19 has been securitized? And does it bring more harm or benefit to the international cooperation if your answer is yes? And the final question is from uh, Ms. Anne Quinot. Uh, does the development of mini laterals uh, undermine ASEAN centrality in the security area? So we have uh, yeah, a, a lot of questions and maybe I'd like to invite first uh, Pat Shofwan to, to give his response. Thank you very much, uh, Pa Ibrahim. And uh, first uh, on the first question from the Sri Lankan embassy uh, on uh, will Indonesia uh, becoming more dependent on other countries for political uh, security and uh, stability. I think uh, it depends. Uh, uh, it, it is indeed that the pandemic has created the structural uh, uh, condition, uh, which uh, enlarge the possibility of uh, uh, more dependence of uh, not only Indonesia, but also uh, any uh, other countries. Uh, since uh, the way out from the pandemic for now is only uh, seen in uh, the uh, vaccine production, we uh, still see that there are uh, very uh, few uh, uh, countries are able to produce uh, uh, such uh, vaccine and have the ability to uh, distribute it. So uh, this situation is of course created the material uh, condition, the structural uh, 
condition, the structural constraint, uh, which uh, created uh, the possibilities for increasing dependence. So the first answer is that, uh, yes, indeed, the structural uh, uh, constraint uh, uh, provides uh, uh, incentive to that direction. However, uh, second, uh, it is also important to uh, always note that uh, uh, states and not only states, uh, actors are not, uh, uh, how to say, passive uh, actors who can uh, only, uh, who can, uh, who, whose action uh, was only dictated by this structural imperative. Uh, uh, power manifests through uh, skill and context and while the context the structural context creates the condition in which uh, uh, dependence uh, it seems to be uh, the possible uh, uh, scenario forward there are uh, aspects that are within uh, the reach of the policymakers so it depends on uh, how can we deal with the decreasing list of options uh, by optimizing uh, the independence. So I think the, the key is on uh, how we can diversify uh, our interaction with great powers uh, uh, amidst this pandemic. And I think the efforts by the Indonesian government to uh, diversify uh, its sources of vaccines shows uh, this understanding that uh, we should not uh, rely on one source of vaccine. We should also uh, uh, try to uh, get other uh, sources of vaccine, you know, some going to UK, AstraZeneca, some uh, going to the US, Pfizer. Uh, uh, and, and I think uh, uh, if managed well, uh, it could be uh, a way out to uh, minimize the possibility uh, or the 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 constraint of, uh, of uh, uh, the structure which which creates the condition for dependence uh, and third point is that uh, political security aspect is not a monodimensional uh, situation uh, uh, there are different issues and aspects even with the, within this uh, particular dimension as and as i mentioned uh, there is a tendency of uh, enlargement of the sector uh, 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 included within the logic of state security. So uh, not the acceptance of non-traditional security uh, in the mainstream security issue, but the enlargement of the sector uh, arranged through the traditional uh, security uh, logic. Uh, and this uh, of course, this will also uh, animate the, the, the relationship between uh, Indonesia and others in not only in purely or hard uh, security and political sector, but also in other as seen in the uh, vaccine issue. So I think then uh, other sectors will be also animated by this logic. Uh, and thus, as a consequence, I think there will be uh, efforts to develop uh, industrial policies uh, as we see as we see vaccine uh, development needs state intervention need a lot of state resources many uh, efforts to combat uh, impacts of uh, uh, COVID and also uh, future pandemics will also need a lot of uh, interventions of the state so I think uh, uh, Another uh, counterbalancing potential for uh, dependency is the uh, increasing capacity of the state. So I think, can we escape from the fate of dependency? Uh, depends. The structural con constraints say yes, it, uh, it limits our option. It created uh, potential for more dependency, but uh, there are uh, 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 open uh, possibilities in which different policies will create different pathways and one important aspect of it is uh, how to ensure uh, that we increase our capacity we diversify our uh, patterns of relationship first second we uh, must ensure that we have uh, uh, capac enough capacity in 
in strategic uh, aspects of uh, uh, of our people's life. So I think that's the point. Uh, so it's not really decided uh, yet. Uh, the structural constraint is yes, uh, going to that direction. But we are, uh, uh, of course, there are possibilities to to mitigate the effect. Uh, and this is connected to the second question on whether this COVID-19 has been uh, securitized. I think, uh, I think uh, to some extent, yes, we see this in the vaccine race. Uh, even though we are not uh, uh, seeing, uh, how to say, military uh, uh, rhetorics, uh, 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 how to say, in in multilateral organizations or something, but we witness uh, some degree of securitization in which uh, uh, states see uh, the way uh, their their ability to deal with uh, COVID-19 will pretty much decide uh, their fate in, in international relations. That's why uh, uh, there is a vaccine race. That's why uh, uh, the US, uh, how to say, uh, uh, feels very insecure uh, because of the situation in the US is worsening while China is already uh, recovering. So I think, yes, there are some degrees of uh, securitization. Uh, um, uh, does it bring more harm or benefit to the international cooperation? Um, it depends. Uh, it is just natural. Uh, uh, when, when order broke, when uh, international order broke, of course, there is a tendency of rising in insecurity and rising insecurity, uh, of course, uh, create tensions. And this is just uh, uh, natural. The, the point is how to manage such insecurity and, and return some uh, degree of order to, to, to the situation. So I think uh, uh, does it bring more harm or benefit to international cooperation? Uh, uh, it depends. There are some uh, some uh, potential harms uh, in 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 forms of increasing tensions. If uncontrolled, it can accelerate the uh, breakdown of the international order, uh, as as illustrated in the uh, conflict between the U.S. and China in the WHO. But at the same time, uh, it can also uh, accelerate uh, uh, the efforts because by securitization, countries mobilize uh, resources more effectively. And by mobilizing uh, resources more effectively and by seeing this as an existential issue, uh, of course, we can get a uh, vaccine faster uh, rather than uh, desecuritizing it. Uh, and, and and putting it uh, in the hands of the companies because state sees this as, as an existential threat, as an existential challenge, uh, they mobilize the resource and that's good. Uh, so I think it has a uh, good and, and, and bad aspect. The point is how to, how to manage uh, this uh, good and bad uh, aspects uh, effectively. And I think uh, uh, on, on the minilaterals, I think it pretty much uh, depends. Uh, I, uh, in, in, in the economic realm, we uh, understand the, uh, the idea of ASEAN minus X. And I think that is an interesting idea to try in, in the security aspect. Of course, uh, only with the agreement between uh, ASEAN uh, countries and the understanding that uh, this minilateralism uh, uh, would not be the, the, the sign that ASEAN centrality is weakening. If minilateralism uh, is uh, useful to, uh, to, prof to provide uh, uh, ways uh, out from stagnation and to ensure that ASEAN can still be working, then that will be good. Uh, uh, and then another on RCEP. Uh, I think RCEP will be an interesting uh, development. Uh, it is interesting to wait for uh, Biden's uh, response to this, uh, whether uh, the US will return to TPP and uh, what, what kind of uh, arrangements within the TPP uh, will uh, provide to uh, answer the RCEP.
I think uh, other speakers will uh, provide better and more comprehensive uh, assessments on uh, this question. So I stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pa uh, uh, Next, uh, Pa Arisje, would you like to give your responses? Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, the very interesting questions. Uh, so I think if I may I, I add a little bit answers to the questions uh, directed to Pa Sofwan on whether on the COVID-19 will create more, uh, Indonesia is more dependent to other countries in terms of political security. Uh, it's very interesting questions. Uh, what, what, I, what, what I can think of is that indeed, I think it's uh, undeniable uh, that uh, uh, COVID-19 will make uh, every country on earth, I think depends on one another in, a, in very much more sense. Uh, thinking of like, uh, how, 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 who can imagine on like a viruses uh, uh, that happened in a food market in Wuhan, like millions of kilometers away far from Indonesia, I think can impact, have a very significant impact uh, more than beyond that we can imagine on in terms of security economy to Indonesia. Uh, uh, we are not uh, like really uh, next to uh, China. So I think uh, we are indeed uh, living in a, in a world that more connected than ever before. and more connected beyond our imaginations. Uh, I, I would like to quote uh, Professor Kishore Magubani in, in his book, uh, The Great Convergence. He said that we're not living uh, again, uh, if he put an analogy that uh, uh, maybe in, in the 18th centuries, uh, uh, he, anal uh, he given an analogy that uh, each and every state is uh, living in a different separated boat and an international law therefore exists to maintain that each uh, small boat will not clash to one another. But now here in the 21st century, uh, he mentioned that we are all of the world, all countries living in one big boat that uh, so that because we are facing a lot of common uh, challenge uh, together, uh, pandemic, economics, everything is very interconnected uh, one to one another. So I think uh, I'm very, uh, in my perspective, like indeed the, the, the COVID-19 will put Indonesia and all of our states to, to becoming more dependent to one another. For instance, in terms of, of economy uh, recovery and also the vaccine, uh, I think uh, yes, indeed, and it's, it's undeniable that we will uh, becoming more dependent to uh, another states, especially the, the uh, dev uh, much more developing states. But uh, but I, but I don't necessarily think that is uh, a negative. Uh, I, I I tend to look at more on a positive term. So it means that uh, there should be more uh, international cooperations between uh, states. Uh, in order to tackle uh, the, the challenges together. So uh, if the question is, will the COVID-19 uh, put more Indonesia more dependent to other states? I think the answer is yes, but it's not necessary in a negative term. I think it's, it's, it will be creating more opportunities to collaborate and cooperations uh, between states. So that was the, uh, the, the first uh, uh, answers. And the second, uh, maybe to the second questions on whether the uh, uh, COVID-19 is being securitized. Uh, well, well, to, uh, as a disclaimer that I'm not an international uh, relations scholar. So, so, so I might view not, not from the really theoretical uh, uh, aspect of uh, how you define like security. So, but I think uh, whether if the question is whether the COVID-19 is getting uh, more securitized, I think uh, uh, yes, uh, to some extent, because of, uh, as, we, as I discussed earlier, and also uh, during our discussions that uh, the COVID-19 is have a, a very uh, a huge impact to security both to, to traditional security uh, in a sense that um, uh, states might use the pandemic uh, to enforce or to uh, China, for instance, to, uh, to assert their military claim in the South China Sea when the other countries is uh, perceived as a weaker during the pandemic. So, so, so in terms of secure, uh, traditional security implications of the pandemic, I think uh, yes, it is very relevant. And also in a non-traditional security relevant uh, uh, where uh, security as what uh, the previous speaker mentions that uh, it's getting more on human centered security uh, on the health, uh, public health crisis uh, uh, security. So, so I think the response uh, to, to, to the, the security challenge is, is, is uh, different to uh, uh, the issues. And I think, uh, and then and the, the, the next question is whether the RC, our, our CEP will uh, uh, put uh, uh, impact or uh, influence to the uh, political security in the region. So I think I just want to answer it very uh, briefly. Uh, I think uh, it might uh, create, I think it, it might create more stability in a sense that when, uh, from my perspective, uh, when states have more on economic cooperations, uh, and I think uh, uh, people, uh, they demand uh, a peaceful, peaceful and stable region. So I think 
uh, with the R uh, RCEP, one of the, the biggest uh, economic cooperations uh, that ever uh, human ever had. I think there will be more uh, uh, stability and, and uh, states will, will demand more stability and secure security in, in the regions. So, uh, Mas Ibrahim, I think uh, that is my, my uh, answer. And I have to really apologize that I have to uh, uh, leave uh, from this uh, uh, webinar. But I think I, I really, I really uh, learned a lot from, from the previous speakers. And also, I really enjoyed the knowledge and, and the discussions that we had. So, Mas Ibrahim, if, if I may, uh, thank you very much uh, for the Happy Center. Oh, uh, thank you for so much, uh, Mas Aristio, for, for, for everything. And, and uh, yes, hope to see you uh, next event as well. Um, okay, so um, turning on to our last uh, speaker, Ms. Mira, would you like to give your response as well? Okay, thank you so much. Um, I actually also have to leave in a few minutes, but I'm trying my best to answer all the questions because uh, I have another schedule to attend. Uh, for the first question from Noto, yeah? uh, do you think the COVID-19 has been securitized? If your answer is yes, uh, does it bring more harm or benefit to the international cooperation? Well, no, to, to be honest, uh, with this global pandemic, this is a wake up call for everyone. Uh, and we should uh, think this for an opportunity to better, uh, to, better to, to have better cooperation uh, in a global uh, world. But how the world could uh, cooperate is another question. Um, <clears throat> in, re in realist perspective, uh, this would not be easy. This would be quite difficult to see more cooperation. Um, in, in, your, in my presentation, uh, as I said about the prisoner's dilemma, about the vaccine nationalism, what I read from foreign affairs uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks, that uh, it depends on uh, how the world would like to take these uh, chances to cooperate one to another. And uh, whether we should <clears throat> uh, cooperate or uh, wh whether we should wait and see. So uh, my answer is, I'm trying to be optimistic here, even though that we know that uh, it's hard to cooperate uh, in, in global scale, but um, this is a wake up call for everyone. I think everyone wants to be a, a safe, uh, uh, wants to have the safety first. So uh, I think, yeah, uh, for better cooperation, of course. So second, uh, second question from uh, French Embassy, uh, minilaterals uh, for, to ASEAN centrality. Well, to be honest, uh, <clears throat> if we uh, take a look to the character, uh, character of minilateralism, it's quite appealing since uh, it has only functional cooperation and, and uh, quite loose regionalism. It's, it's, uh, it's quite different with uh, multilateralism. But when it comes to, major, to, uh, to deal with major powers, for example, uh, China here, um, it's going to be uh, a potential risk that uh, the major power will lead the discussion for their own interest, for their for their own agenda. So uh, that's actually uh, uh, my answer to to your question. And will it be undermine ASEAN centrality? Well, uh, we have a very unique uh, characteristic in ASEAN member states. Uh, there, uh, we have to acknowledge that some of the states are quite close to China rather than the others. And we, we have to acknowledge that some of our countries, uh, some of ASEAN member states uh, have problems in South China Sea. So it depends on how we uh, perceive this ASEAN centrality, but my, uh, my answer will be yes, it will uh, quite undermine ASEAN centrality if uh, it deals with major power like uh, China, for example. <clears throat> This, uh, the last question from the Sri Lanka Embassy. Thank you for uh, the questions about RCEP. Yes, it was initiated actually by ASEAN. Uh, I forgot it, it was in 2011 or 2012. The, the discussion began, uh, I think, from Martina Palagawa at that time. Um, <clears throat> the implementation of uh, RCEP uh, signed a couple of days ago, it actually signaled uh, the enhancement of ASEAN and China relations. So uh, even though it is initiated by uh, ASEAN, it will be dominated by China in this case. Um, unfortunately, uh, as uh, previously said by Pak uh, the US withdraw from the TPP and we don't know yet uh, in Biden's administration whether the US will, uh, will be back in the region. We're trying to uh, uh, get more influence uh, in the region, but 
uh, in this case, uh, yeah, uh, the uh, it depends on it depends on how China uh, actually uh, play uh, its roles and giving influence in the RCEP. Because uh, talking about markets and uh, uh, and uh, talking about markets, uh, China dominated uh, the ASEAN countries. So I think that's all, Mas Ibrahim. Uh, my hmm. answers. Perhaps the other speakers have. Uh, more answers to this? Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Mira. So I think we've come to the end of, of today's uh, discussion. So um, I'd like to uh, thank our, our three speakers to Aristio, to Pasofwa, and to uh, Ms. Mira for your presentations and for all your comments and responses. Uh, I'd also like to thank our participants for uh, taking part in today's uh, discussion. Uh, as always, we'll have our uh, discussion reports and, and the power. The PowerPoint presentations available on our website and our mailing list. So please make sure to to uh, provide us your details uh, in the link provided in the YouTube uh, live chat. And yeah, so uh, thank you again, uh, everyone. Uh, stay safe, uh, stay stay healthy, sure. and and look forward to seeing you at our. Thank you event. and bless everyone. And happy anniversary thank again. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice meeting you, Mas Afwan, uh, Mas Ibrahim, and and. Yeah. Habibi Center. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.